let's begin the 13th lecture on 1st and 2nd Kings. Today, we will begin with 2nd Kings chapter 1. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, King Ahaziah gets injured and sends messengers to ask for a god. As soon as Ahaziah, son of Ahab, became king, Moab rebelled against Israel. Usually when a nation becomes weak, subject states rise up against it. King Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room and got injured. He should have repented and prayed to God in times of trouble, but instead he sent messengers to ask Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, if he would recover from his injury. God was enraged that Ahaziah consulted a foreign god instead of God. Even if he did not receive an answer from God, he should not have gone to a foreign God. In the same way, when things do not go well when we obey God's word, we must not turn to humanly ways or follow the world. If we seek God's answer with repentant and desperate hearts, God will surely answer us. In verses 3 through 8, Elijah pronounces judgment of God on Ahaziah through his messengers. Elijah rebuked the messengers and told them that the king would not rise from the bed and would die. The messengers feared God, returned to the king, and told him exactly what they heard from Elijah. They returned in the middle of their journey to carry out the king's command after they heard the words of Elijah and we can see how great Elijah's authority was. The messengers reported to the king exactly what they heard from Elijah. After hearing the report, King Ahaziah realized that the man was Elijah. Elijah had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. From verses 9 through 15a, three captains, each with 50 men, go up to Elijah. Even after the king heard the word of punishment from God, he refused to repent and ordered the captains to capture Elijah. When Elijah prayed, fire fell down from heaven and consumed the captain and the fifty men. Elijah was a man of God who moved according to God's commands. To attempt to capture a servant of God was the same as opposing God. Those who try to capture a man of God will surely receive judgment. Fire symbolizes judgment. Whoever despises and disobeys God and whoever harms the works of God by harming the servants of God will receive judgment. The king then sent another captain with his fifty men the second time, and they too received the judgment of fire. 
The king then sent a third captain with fifty men. However, this captain believed that God was alive, and he feared God. The captain fell on his knees before Elijah and told him, "Man of God, please have respect for my life." And the lives of these fifty men, your servants. God saw this to be worthy and told Elijah to go with them. They feared God more than the king. They feared God's command more than the king's command. Hence, Elijah was safe. Even if he went to the king to tell him about God's judgment, in verses 15b through 16, Elijah meets King Ahaziah and rebukes him. Elijah went to the king, guarded by the captain and his fifty men. The soldiers who went to capture him. Became his guards. Elijah rebuked the king for sending messengers to ask for Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, and declared that he would die on that bed, as God told Elijah. Elijah received God's command and boldly rebuked the king. And he prophesied that judgment would be on the king. In verses 17 through 18, Ahaziah dies, and Joram succeeds him as king. Because Ahaziah had no son, his younger brother Joram became king. The year Joram became king. Was the second year of Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. However, in chapter three, verse one, we can see that Joram became the king of Israel in Samaria, in the eighteenth year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The two verses seem to contradict each other, but they do not. This is because Joram became king of Judah in the sixteenth year of reign of Jehoshaphat. In chapter two, verses one through eight, Elisha follows Elijah until the end. The Lord told Elijah that he would be taken up alive, and Elijah told this to Elisha. Why did the Lord take Elijah up to heaven without letting him see death? First, it was to let all believers know that they will eventually. Be resurrected and taken back to heaven. Second, it was to let us know that our home is in heaven. In Genesis chapter five, verse twenty-four, God also took Enoch alive without letting him see death. Elijah went from Gilgal to Bethel. With Elisha, Elisha told Elisha to stay in Gilgal. Elisha did not order Elisha to stay there, but suggested that he stay there. However, Elisha was determined to follow Elisha until the end. Elisha received the spirit of Elijah because he followed his master until the end. 
Elijah told him several times not to follow him, and the company of the prophets also told him not to follow him. But Elijah suffered and followed Elijah until the end. The company of prophets in Bethel knew that the Lord would take away Elijah. They tried to dissuade Elisha from following his master. They watched from a distance, but did not follow Elisha. However, Elisha had faith, and he followed Elisha, rejecting the advice of the company of the prophets. The same thing happened in Bethel. Then Elijah and Elisha went to Jericho. Elisha told Elijah the same thing in Jericho. The company of the prophets in Jericho tried to dissuade him, just as the prophets did in Bethel. Why did Elijah ask Elisha to stay behind? First, Elijah wanted to see how devoted Elisha was, and wanted to test him. Second, Elijah wanted Elisha to yearn for a double portion of his spirit. That was why Elijah asked him to stay behind at Bethel, Jericho, and at the Jordan. Elijah wanted to give Elisha more grace, so that he could carry out the works of God. Elisha achieved this because he overcame all the tests. And followed his master until the end. When Elijah struck the Jordan River with his cloak, the water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Elijah's power was displayed here. In verses nine through ten, Elijah asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Before Elijah was taken up to heaven, he asked Elisha what he wanted. Elisha asked his master for a double portion of his spirit. Elisha may appear arrogant here, but he was not. This was because first, the firstborn receives half the inheritance when the inheritance is distributed. Elisha asked for a double portion to inherit the remaining works of Elisha. Just as a firstborn would receive a double portion of the inheritance. Second, Elisha's time was much more wicked than the time of Elisha. Elisha was lacking compared to Elisha, and he could not work with the spirit of Elisha. Elisha was younger than Elisha, and he lacked skills and experiences as well as faith. In order to succeed the works of his master, Elisha needed double the portion of his master's spirit to continue what his master started. Today, in the last days, sins are increasing, 
and the intensity of evil is increasing. We believers need the power of the Spirit and the truth to overcome evil. A double portion of your spirit does not necessarily mean twice the amount of his spirit, but just more spirit. Elijah heard God's holy and faint voice and he taught Elisha all the things he heard and equipped him to build up the true church. It was difficult to receive a double portion of his spirit. Yet the Lord said that it was possible if Elisha watched Elijah go up to heaven. In verse 11, Elijah is taken up to heaven. The chariot of fire and horses of fire symbolize the mobility of the army of angels. Elijah went up in a whirlwind. The whirlwind that took Elijah was a spiritual wind. When Jesus returns, all believers will go up in a cloud, and that will be a spiritual cloud. Elisha would only receive the double portion of Elijah's spirit if he watched Elijah go up to heaven until the end. There were many obstacles in watching Elijah being taken up in a whirlwind until the end. Why did Elijah tell him to watch until the end? First, Elisha was to yearn for God. Second, Elisha was to obey God's command. God chose to give Elisha the spirit through Elisha. Thus, Elisha obeyed God's command when he watched as Elisha was taken up to heaven. Elisha did not fear the strong wind, and he was devoted to Elisha, and he obeyed God's command. In verses 12 through 14, Elisha picks up Elijah's cloak. Elisha called Elijah the chariots and horsemen of Israel. He meant that Elijah played a role in protecting Israel like the chariots and horsemen. Elijah protected Israel until that point, and Elisha asked himself who would now protect Israel. Elisha did not ask for a double portion of Elijah's spirit for himself, but solely for Israel. He had faith that sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It says that Elisha tore his own clothes. This was a symbolic act of transformation from the old self to the new self. He needed to tear his garment before he could take the cloak of Elijah. We must get rid of our opinions, our wills, greed, selfishness, and all kinds of wickedness, and clothe ourselves with power that comes from God and Elijah. 
even though Elijah went to a place where he could not be seen, Elisha was able to see the cloak falling from the sky as he watched Elijah go up to heaven. This was the way to receive power. We must love Jesus and look upon him with love for his spirit. When we follow Jesus until the end, no matter what troubles and persecutions we face, we can receive the power of God. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak and returned to the Jordan. He then struck the river, which divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed the river on dry ground. Elisha asked, Where now is the Lord? This was the same as asking, Aren't you here? First, this showed that Elisha believed that the God of Elijah was here. Second, Elisha meant that he would move forward by the power of God that was with Elijah. Third, Elisha believed that he received the double portion of Elijah's spirit. Fourth, he asked the Lord to work right away. Elisha struck the water with such faith, and the waters of the Jordan split, and he crossed over on dry ground. In verses 15 through 18, the company of the prophets come to Elisha. They previously opposed of Elisha following Elijah, but now they saw him divide the Jordan River and came to welcome him, knowing that the spirit of Elijah was now with Elisha. In this way, even though there are people who criticize and persecute us when we obey and believe in God's word, they will bow and kneel before us when God's power is displayed through us. Fifty of the company of the prophets came to Elisha and asked him to let them look for Elijah. Elisha said that it was not necessary. This was because he knew that the Lord had taken his master up to heaven. The company of the prophets saw it as well, but they did not understand God's will behind it. They did not believe in the power of God. The power of God could take Elijah to heaven. Elisha did not forcefully stop them from asking to look for Elijah. Their request was a faithless act, but Elisha did not stop them. Elisha did not stop them because he knew that they needed to go and see for themselves to believe that Elijah was taken up to heaven. The prophets went around looking for Elijah but failed to find him and returned to Elisha embarrassed. Lack of faith in the works of God will result in embarrassment and rebuke from God. 
In verses 19 through 22, the bad water turns into good water. The land of the city of Jericho was well situated, but the water was bad and the land was unproductive. Hearing this, Elisha went to pray to God. God gave him a solution, and it was to throw salt in a new bowl. Elisha did just as God told him to, and the water became wholesome. The new bowl symbolizes the works of the Spirit, and the salt symbolizes God's word of the covenant. Thus, throwing salt in a new bowl meant that God's word of covenant was spiritually received and became spiritual life. If our spirits cannot accept God's word as new life, we will not bear fruit of faith. When we receive God's word as spiritual life, there will be fruit in lifeless places. In verses 23 through 25, 42 kids who jeer at Elisha die. When Elisha was on his way to Bethel, some youths came and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head. Go on up, you bald head. Elisha called a curse on them, and two bears came out of the woods and bawled the 42 youths. The man of God cursed these boys in the name of the Lord and made them die because they jeered at him. Elisha was wrong here, wasn't he? However, we cannot say that Elisha did wrong here because he cursed them according to God's will. What was Bethel like? It was a place where Jeroboam made golden calves and caused people to worship them as God. Elisha told the people that it was wrong to serve golden calves, and the people of Bethel hated him for it. The adults hated Elisha, and the children took after them and jeered at the man of God. In this way, when adults jeer at and exclude a servant of God, their children will take after them, and their children will receive punishments before them. Blessed are those who respect and welcome servants of God. Elisha then went to Mount Carmel from Bethel, and then from there he returned to Samaria. Elisha prayed and spread God's word. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Joram becomes king of Israel and gets rid of the sacred stones of Baal. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, died after two years of reign, and his brother Joram succeeded him as king and reigned for twelve years. Ahab made many sacred stones, and his son Joram got rid of them. Although Joram did good things, he was not able to turn away 
from the sins of Jeroboam. Joram worried that the people would return to Judah after serving God in Jerusalem, and thus he walked down the same sinful path of Jeroboam. In verses 4 through 5, Moab rebels against Israel. In verses 6 through 9, three kings unite and go out to attack Moab. Because the king of Moab rebelled against Israel, Joram, king of Israel, planned to attack Moab, and he suggested that Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join him. Jehoshaphat agreed to join King Joram in battle. It was wrong for him to do so. Jehoshaphat faced damages when he went to battle alongside Ahab in the past. Jehoshaphat could not stay strong in the truth and he compromised with unrighteous powers. Jehoshaphat was old and had lots of experience, and he suggested that they attack through the desert of Edom. Then the king of Edom also joined the fight. They marched for seven days, but there was no water for the army and the animals. All of them were about to die of dehydration. This was God's punishment. In verses 10 through 19, three kings go down to Elisha. Jehoshaphat called on the name of God in times of hardships, which shows that he may have served God. However, he did not properly serve God, and he did not know the truth. Joram blamed God for the trouble, but Jehoshaphat sought the prophet of the Lord. One of the officials said that there was Elisha who used to pour water on Elijah's hand. Hence, the three kings went down to Elisha. King Jehoshaphat received Elisha's rebuke. Elisha knew that Jehoshaphat had faith, and thus Elisha took notice of them and told them how they would be able to live. Elisha received the word of the Lord and told it to them. They were to dig ditches in the waterless valley. They were to dig ditches and God would fill the valley with water. Water from God symbolizes God's grace. It also meant that God would give them victory over their enemies. In verses 20 through 27, the three kings unite and defeat Moab just as Elisha prophesied. Just as Elisha prophesied, the water came down and filled the land with water. Two days later in the morning, when the Moabites looked over Edom, they thought that the valley was filled with blood. The Moabites knew that there was no water in the land, and when they saw the water, it looked red like blood, and they thought it was blood. 
Then they went to the camp of Israel to plunder them. Then the Israel army attacked the Moabites and defeated them. War is in the hands of the Lord, and the numbers of armies do not determine victory. They can only win when God allows them to win. The united army of Israel defeated the Moabites and destroyed the towns. They also threw stones until every good field was covered with it. Things became difficult for the king of Moab, and he gathered seven hundred swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they failed. They thought the king of Edom was the weakest among the three. The devil tries to break through us through our weakest spots. In his desperation, the king of Moab sacrificed his firstborn son to the god of Moab. His son. Who was to succeed him as king? What is more important than victory is one's attitude after. We must begin with humility and end with humility. We must not lose our guard when things go well, and we will be ruined. If we believe that things happen by our works, when things go well, we must be humble and believe that it was all God's work, and we must give glory to God. With this, we will conclude the thirteenth lecture on First and Second Kings. Thank you.